Good morning. I am going to first trial the uh, RICS technology. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what I want to present to you today is a piece of research that's been ongoing for about three years and is now coming to its commercialization stage. Uh, as we all are involved in some way or another with reservoir simulation, we know that uh, our oil and gas industry relies on static and dynamic models to help them, inform them, to make actually some decisions that involve quite a lot of, of, of money. Um, one of the challenges there is that our models have to rely on a very small amount of data and that we need to actually estimate um, parameters in unsampled locations. And for that, we use geostatistics. Currently, most geostatistical tools that are implemented in commercial uh, geomodel applications are based on some relationship that is Gaussian, some uh, normal distribution of values. And I think we also know that most of our interesting data for production, such as, for instance, permeability does not, most times does not obey any Gaussian distribution. And so the research has been looking at can we actually do better, incorporate more of the information that exists in the data to better be able to describe things like permeability fields in our models. And so this is about trying to get beyond Gauss. Now, uh, this is a, a team and a collaboration effort. Um, Sebastian Herning is a postdoc in the Energy Simulation Research Program, and he's been uh, writing most of the algorithms. We have a collaboration with Andras Badoshi from the University of Stuttgart, which has also been an honorary professor and has developed quite a lot of the theory behind what I'll be presenting today. I also have a technical working group from um, the three, our three industrial sponsors that I have to thank that have been accompanying us uh, on this journey, have been quite generous of their time, and also uh, bringing us their models to try and trial what we have been developing. And so that would be Brad Pender from Arrow Energy, Brett Pigeon from um, APLNG, and Alan Hansen from Santos. So uh, one of the first problems that we face is that we know that nature gives us all kinds of heterogeneity in the subsurface, and that that affects things like calculating resource volumes, understanding aquifer connectivity, and flow and pressure of water and, and hydrocarbons. Um, now, in order to be able to address heterogeneity, we need to sample it in some way. So the picture you see there is one of the coal seam gas or coal bed methane fields in um, Queensland, and it's roughly around 17 by 11 kilometers, and there are 150 wells in that. Now, uh, just sort of as a little bit of a mind game, if I assume that each well were to sample on a, a volume or a cylinder of about 10 centimetres diameter and 1,000 metres from the overall volume that we're actually wanting to model, uh, we're uh, sampling less than three millionths of a percent of that volume. And uh, what we use to um, interpolate and to estimate and to simulate is just statistics based on that minute amount of data. Now, um, when we're looking at unsampled areas, we have a sample coming out of well data and maybe seismic. And uh, what you see here is a histogram of coal thickness um, in one of the um, CBM fields. And so what you see is that there is a variability in the values of those thicknesses. It doesn't look any much like Gauss. 
And, but there is also a statistical structure in the way that these values are distributed spatially. And what we would like just statistics to do is one, preserve the heterogeneity that the data is reflecting, and also to be able to quantify the uncertainty on the geological model that we derive from that. Um, the way that uh, this is currently done is by assuming that the parameters of interest are actually a uh, function of a geostatistical nature. And um, I actually want to focus here on the assumptions that currently we are doing. So the number one is something somebody, some people call it the geographical law, in which we assume that things that are closer together are more similar to each other than things that are far apart. Another assumption, a strong assumption we do, is the one on stationarity, which actually says that wherever I estimate a value at an un unsamped location, that will tend to be um, represented by some mean, and that the covariance between values, they only have to do with the distance between each other and not with the actual values at those spots. These two assumptions, we violate them happily every day on our day-to-day -day job. Now, um, just statistics normally includes three steps. One is exploring the data that we actually have. Then it's matching some theoretical function to it. And that function is used to interpolate or to estimate data where we don't have any. And a very um, popular way of doing it is to build uh, the semivariogram, which is a uh, graph in which we have, um, oops, in which we display uh, the variance of values based on a distance between two points. And uh, in the semivariogram, when the um, distance, which is called the range, gives us the, basically the space in which data can be correlated, and outside of that, where they assume to be sort of randomly distributed and unrelated. And uh, we can fit a theoretical uh, variogram to it, and that is what we then use to do the next step, which is estimation. One such method, and I'm going to show two to be able to contrast it with the way that we're developing geostatistics, is uh, Krieging, in which your uh, estimate at the unsample location comes from a linear combination of the values in other locations within a certain radius of influence. And they are weighted such that the sum of the weights will be equals to one, which means that then they are an unbiased estimate. And we minimize the variance. So we're assuming a linear relationship, or basically something coming out also out of a normal distribution. And what happens is that the values that we estimate tend to be closer to the mean rather than the extreme values of our distribution. And that our uncertainty and the, the, the variance is only related to the distance between the points. But we ignore the value actually at those points. The result of it is maps that are quite smooth. Uh, and so this is an interpolation technique. The, uh, Next technique, which is quite popular, is the sequential Gaussian simulation. And there, what you are doing, it's a conditional simulation, which means it will honor the data at exactly the points where you, you have them. And uh, the, there are several steps that you go through to do this simulation. And the first one is you transform your data into a standard normal distribution. And for that, you do all kinds of tricks and manipulations to remove uh, trends that are non-Gaussian. Then uh, you define a random path on your grid where you want to populate values. And you calculate, actually, a Krieg estimate at, um, a, at that point with a, a, a variance given within a, a specific sort of radius of, of influence. Now, um, you then uh, 
sample data out of a normal distribution, and then you add that data to your data, and then you do the process again in a next point. So generally, again, the estimates will come out of a normal distribution, and what happens in this case, and I'll show you later on how that looks in a more of a visual manner, the extreme values that you have tend not to be very well connected within your model. Um, so uh, with our industrial partners at the time we started these projects, they were more interested in um, trying to explore more of the data that already exists rather than figure out how to do new measurements, for instance. And so what we were looking at is what can we extract further from the data that gives us more information about the geostatistical character. And so uh, when you look at um, expected values of a mean or the semivariogram, in geostatistics you talk about first and second statistical moments, and so one is to bring in a third statistical moment, which is uh, a measure of the asymmetry or skewness of your distribution. And Andros has been uh, putting together the theoretical uh, underpinning for that. And I'll show you how different a Gaussian distribution looks from a non-Gaussian or non-linear um, distribution. Oops. We're not moving. Houston, we have a problem. Can you move it one forward, maybe? Rick, not enough battery in there? Yeah, I don't do tech support. Ah. <laughs> there we go. Um, so what you see on uh, your left side is a Gaussian field. Just to, to, to pinpoint it, I have a, a, a picture of the defunct 10 mark note that has Mr. Gauss on its, um, on its note. Then, uh, and on the, on the right side, you have a known Gaussian field. Now, um, they both have, oops, no. They both have exactly the same permeability values, and they have the same histogram, and they have the same variogram, but they have different asymmetry functions. So, uh, new technology here. Pointer. Well, let's forget about pointer. So uh, the the first the, the the first pictures on the top are a, a field that's been created, one with the sequential Gaussian simulation and one with a non-Gaussian uh, algorithm. The next graph on the on 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 the bottom of that shows you actually the variograms, and below that you have a function of the asymmetry of those distributions. So on the left, what you see, the asymmetry is uh, very small, and they can, they, it can be positive or negative, and on the right, you see that there is a positive asymmetry. If you now focus on the field, and let's assume it's a permeability field on your left, what you will see are high values in red blobs, and then we've got blobs in blue, which are the low values, and they are more or less like islands that are connected by average values, which is sort of the yellowy-greeny. So the connected pathways goes there through the averages. In contrast, in the nonlinear geostatistical field, you there see red blobs and uh, there seems to be also some yellowy, greeny blobs, and the connected areas are the ones in blue. And that's what also is meant by a positive asymmetry. The positive asymmetry means that your extreme high values are fairly isolated and they are being connected by your low values, your blue values. 
Now, in terms of permeability, we also know that, also especially for fractured reservoirs, for instance, the extreme values are the ones that actually determine what flow looks like. Your high values will give you your flow path, and your low values are basically your flow barriers. So we believe that this is possibly a better way of uh, being able to display data when we're looking at flow models. Oops. The, the, the geostatistical construct that is used to build those non-Gaussian fields are called copulas. And copulas, the multivariate distribution functions that are, that are defined on a hypercube from zero to one. A hypercube because they have to be um, valid in n dimensions. Now, in contrast, remembering the variogram, the variogram is always comparing two points to each other. With the copulas, we can compare all points to each other. So we sort of extend um, the, the, the use of the data more. And they have um, quite a few mathematical um, properties that are quite good, and I'm not going to really go into it very much, but to show you that there are some serious mathematics in here, and uh, sort of on the bottom right, what you see is the function for actually estimating values. So there is much more complexity in there, but basically that is the theoretical uh, curve that is matched to the data. Like in a sense, this is the n-dimensional, like a variogram-like um, construct. But I think more interesting is to start to look at how this can be applied. And it, it is similar with the sequential Gaussian simulation in which you first um, look at the data, and in this case, uh, what you do is you um, transform it into a field between zero and one. So you rank your data, your smallest value you call zero, the highest value one, and then you calculate all the others in between. This also ensures that the, the statistical character of the spatial structures are still preserved. And then you examine uh, the asymmetry, and then you have to match a copula to that data. And so what you see on the bottom, this series of, of squares that are in color, they are the equivalent of, uh, let's say, a variogram analysis. Each of the squares represent a certain lag distance between all the points that you are analyzing. And the example that we have here is just um, values of a gamma ray log. And um, the, so the asymmetry can be also looked at uh, from those colored pictures in which symmetric distributions would be looking the same on each side of the diagonal or any diagonal of those pictures. Now, the way that you proceed is similar again to the sequential Gaussian simulation. Uh, you have a grid, your, your model grid, wherever you have purple dots, those are the unsampled locations, the green ones are the sampled ones. You uh, define a random path through those points, and then uh, you use the um, statistical distribution of your values, and you estimate your, uh, uh, through Monte Carlo, a value at that location that's taken from the cumulative distribution function. And then you add that estimate to your data set, and then you repeat it over and over again over a random path. And then if you want to repeat this over a different random path, you then obtain another um, realization of the process and you can establish then also what your uncertainty is. Now, the, 
importance of it is to try and look at the impact of using the different just statistical techniques. So the impact on volumes, um, I'm showing it in an example of one uh, coal bed methane field in which uh, you want to calculate, for instance, the gas initially in place. And that has to do with, of course, the area of your coal seams, the thickness of it, the gas content and the density of the coal. So um, the sequential Gaussian simulation estimate gives you a histogram which is represented by the black that's also partly in the background, while the uh, copula-based statistics shows you is shown in, in purple. And you can see that the differences in the resource estimates can be quite dramatic. Now, the impact on flow can also be observed here. I've, I've used sort of a, a, an algorithm to step through a, a path. So again, you've got Gauss on the left and non-Gauss on the right. And uh, what you see is because of the positive asymmetry, the, uh, let's say, our particle of fluid struggles to find its way through the blues and try and getting into the high perm zones, and what happens is you, you have quite a difference in, in travel time depending on um, which uh, technique that you use. Uh, finally, I have a, a, an example of a five-spot um, simulation in a um, coal seam gas. And again, on the, on the left, you'll have the Gaussian field, again stating same values of permeability, same variogram, but then we've got um, on the right a positive asymmetry and then on, on further on the right again a negative asymmetry. And just to get the, sort of a view of the impact on gas production rates, the cumulative gas production and the cumulative water production, the Gauss curve is the one in the centre. But you can see the deviations can be quite uh, dramatic. It could be more than 20% in the cumulative production. And this is just by changing the permeability field. All else is, is the same. So based on these models and a more systematic study that we've been doing, um, looking, comparing various um, techniques, um, the industrial partners, after also trialling some of it in their own field, decided we need to think about how to commercialise this, how to make it available, and one of the options that was selected was to say, well, a lot of us work in, in a defined commercial um, software packages, so we could uh, build a patrol plugin and therefore make it then um, easy to integrate in existing workflows within the industry. And uh, with that, we actually went to the National um, Energy Research of Australia, which tends to like to fund uh, exactly the transition between research into, into commercial implementation. And uh, so we're building this petrol plugin. It has a, a quite a lot of um, functionalities that our partners have been quite testing and suggesting. And um, I think there is a, a video. So if you are familiar with petrol, this is what it looks like. You will be going into the property modeling module of it. And uh, the copula statistics is just going to appear like another one of these options that exist already in Petrel. But one of the good things is that user has quite a lot of, of, of um, power to actually manipulate the fit of the copulas and immediately be able to see the impact on the field. And so is able also to try and include, let's say, more of a geological reasoning in determining what the field looks like. So um, with that, I'd like to summarize that um, copulative statistics, I think, is especially suitable for highly re uh, heterogeneous reservoirs. Um, we hope to have a petrol plug-in uh, early, sometime early next year. And it just remains for me to um, acknowledge the uh, industrial partners and NERO for the funding and um, also acknowledge um, CMG Limited and Schlumberger that have provided uh, software for these studies. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, questions? Now, I have one, uh, slide number 17. Uh, we don't necessarily have to go over there. When you mentioned about um, that the lower permeabilities are better connected so that the flow path uh, would take longer and may not even yeah. come out in terms of production. But on the other hand, if you look at the extremes, you have the red blob, uh, the blobs of red, then the higher perms probably were better connected as well. So I guess we cannot really draw a conclusion one way or another which way um, would enhance the production and, and reserves. It really depends on the geology and how well connected each one it is. I, I could see with the modeling, with this type of the geological description, uh, let's say I'm doing a water flood, I'll see my you know, high perm streaks uh, producing oil at a higher rate, so I could see a product production curve with high initial production, and then it dies pretty quickly. So on a reserve basis, it could be lower, a, a little bit more, uh, yeah, lower than what you expect from a regular simulation. Well, um, these cases, in a way, they are more synthetic because they're really trying to pinpoint the what's in the different techniques. Now, if you're looking at your own field data set, and right now we're working on a field that has 700 wells, that starts to clearly demonstrate where the asymmetry lies. So which parts, are, is it going to be the higher values or the lower values that are going to be more connected? So the data is actually going to be able to inform you which copula that you're going to be using to match right. in your field. Now, what we've not done yet is to be able to feed back the production data mm. into figuring out how that could affect, how could we use it to guide further the, the, the just statistical technique. Right. So has any one of the operators actually try venture out and actually do the well to the hot spots? Well, uh, what they've done, we've uh, prepared a permeability field for one of the companies. Mm -hmm. And what they've uh, told us is that uh, history matching has been extremely easier than before. Um, Colbert methane, one of the issues on history matching is that there are a, a lot more parameters to match than they are in a more conventional setting, mm -hmm. which makes history matching quite more uncertain. And apparently that has, has given them a better results on uh, specifically the Bowen coals, which are, are much thicker coals, and it's a field of 200 wells that they've been producing for at least a decade. Okay. So that's quite encouraging. Good. Um, any other questions? If not, we'll go on to lunch and thank Dr. Herder for the presentation.